I mean, I mean, Nindaway Maganaduk. That means hello, my relatives. How are y'all doing out there? Yeah, I was already doing the participation on how you were feeling. That was good. That was really getting going. I did have a question for Ken. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of my slides, but where I live, I live, uh, you know, I say I live where the wild things are. And, uh, and there, there used to be a lot of geese. And now there's no geese, and so I was like, oh, the geese are all dying. But then I noticed that trumpeter swans, and they're like bossing those geese around, seriously, right? Y'all see that out there? Yeah, it's like there's a trumpeter swan, and there's a geese kind of moving away from the trumpeter swan. Is that right? They boss around the geese? And so if they come on a lake, then they can boss the geese off? I mean, I got like 30 trumpeter swans or 40 trumpeter swans on my lake. I used to have 40 geese, right? Does that make sense? Okay, thank you, Ken. <laughs> no, it's one of those things because I was like, been bought, you know, it's been watching it, you know. So um, again, Ani Nindewe Maganatuk, that means hello, my relatives. Benesi Kwe Indigenikaz, Thunderbird Woman, that's my name, Bird. Makwa um, Ndodeam, I'm Bear Clan, Bear Clan, and Gawaba uh, Banikog from the White Earth Reservation, which is in northern Minnesota. White Earth uh, means where the, where the clay is white you know, up in my territory. Y'all know where Minnesota is, right? Very good. So I'm between Bemidji and Fargo. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's where I'm from. Now this, um, I'm gonna talk to you about the work we do, and uh, this, is, this is a little bit of who we are. This is a water protector. I'm a water protector. And this is a woman who is, uh, this painting is in downtown Duluth, um, on 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue. And uh, this is some art that we sponsored. The artist is named Votan. But I like to say that because, you know, a lot of you have probably very little experience with Native people. You know, I want you to know I think about white people every day, in case you're wondering, you know. But you guys think about Native people like on Thanksgiving and stuff like that, a few other times, right? <laughs> you all know what I'm saying, right? And, and Native women are often missing and murdered. We, this is a huge problem in North America. But, you know, just like we're so devalued, frankly. We're so, so devalued. And so... Um, when we put this woman up, she's like 40 feet by 30 feet. You know, she, we're very present. And so I wanted to start with some art. And, and in, in part of what I know, which is what you know, is, is that how the imagery changes the view of the world, you know, and being very present. So this is some of the work of Honor the Earth, and uh, this is a water protector. This is where I live, Gawawee Gamug, Round Lake in the middle of the White Earth Reservation. And I do think of it as the place where the wild things are. Because where I live, you know, I talked about the swans and the geese, but I got wolves. I, have, I even have a wolverine I saw one day, like, moseying down the road. You know, I have bears. I have wolves. I have, they all live there, you know. And so my responsibility, my covenant with the Creator, as an Anishinaabe Kwe, my covenant is to do my part. You know, because humans in our, in our world, humans were the last ones to arrive. And in our world, what we understood is that we learned a lot from our relatives. We learned how to survive. Because humans are really kind of pathetic in the big picture of, like, if you're going to survive, you need everybody else to take care of you, right? Like some of those other creatures, they're just continuing their mission. They don't need us, actually. The buffalo doesn't actually need us, right? But we need all them guys. We need all them guys. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to keep it good for them. So that in the morning, when the, or in the spring, when the bears wake up, it's the same. You understand what I'm saying? When the, when, when the geese come back to the northern lakes, it's the same. There's still the lake. There's still the rice. That's my job. That's my job. Is to keep the covenant. We, we refer to it as keeping the covenant with the Creator, as a part of our instructions, our Minobamana and our Anishinaabe instructions. So this is also where I live. I... Uh, I'm kind of laughing at myself because I, I live on a farm and I live on a lake. And so this is kind of my team. I have about 11 horses there. And uh, I just, you know, so I kind of brush myself off to come see you. <laughs> Literally, you know, because I'm farming. And everybody, I, 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 I see the one cowboy here, guy here. I usually wear my cowboy hat too. You know, I mean, I farm and I ranch and I, you know, do those things. And I get pretty dusty. And this is the first time I've been in a big city for a while. So thank you for inviting me. Washed up and all. Um, this is some art from our territory. This is, um, the artist's name is Roy Thomas, passed away from uh, northern Ontario near Thunder Bay. But I like to show this art because when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to study the art, uh, 
if you wanted to study the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. If you wanted to study indigenous art, you went to anthropology. So what I want to talk a lot about is a little bit of the valuation of knowledge and the understanding. You know, um, from my perspective, you know, this, this is a totally different worldview. You can look inside those beings and see it's called like x-ray vision inside the beings. And some of these beings, in some of our art, there's spirit lines that connect the beings. In Dinaway Muganatuk, we are relatives. Whether we have wings or fins or roots or paws, we are relatives. That's what the implication of that is, we are relatives. This piece itself is called We Are All in the Same Boat, which is absolutely true. You know, ecologically, we are all in the same canoe. You know, no matter who we are, we are all in peril. We are all in peril. And so, you know, I, I just want to, you know, think about the idea of possibly allowing a different worldview in, into your consciousness. Because it is possible that the solution to the problems we face today may not be made by the, by the paradigm which created those problems. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Like, science ain't just going to fix this stuff. You ain't going to put up, like, some from fog to stop global warming. You ain't gonna be able to put all the carbon back in the ground with some carbon sequestration project. You know, some billions of dollars on some new technology. You know, what you gotta do is figure out how to quit doing dumb stuff. That help a lot, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I raise a lot of kids, that's what I tell them to do. Don't do dumb stuff, it's very expensive. This is where I live. This is where the wild rice is. Anishinaabe people were the people of the wild rice. In our, in our creation story and in our migration story, in our migration story, we lived on the eastern seaboard. We are related to the Wampanoags and the Mi'kmaqs, Wabanakis. We are those people. We are the same people. And we were instructed a long time ago to move to the place where the food grows upon the water. And that's wild rice. That's wild rice. And so I live in a wild rice ecosystem. You know, the place where I live, there are 47 lakes and 500 bodies of water. And this is rice on Big Rice Lake. This is uh, Leonard and Todd Thompson, a couple of guys from my community who are renowned ricers. That wild rice, you harvest it with two sticks in a canoe. You bring it in and parch it by a fire, on a fire, about a couple hours, winnow it, you know, dance on it. That's where that rice comes from. And uh, that's, as you know, there's a lot of birds there too. You know, because this is a, it's, it's a cornerstone species. And for us, it's the center part of our, of our diet. It's our most sacred food. And it's not just about, you know, we do sell that rice, and I'll give you guys a little flag for it. You can order our rice. You know, but the point is, is that it's not just food for money. It's food for your soul. And it's our most sacred food. And so a lot of our battles are about protecting our wild rice, including our most recent work that my tribe passed, the rights of Monoman, the rights of wild rice. And so, you know, this is where I'm from. Now I want to talk about making America great again. How's that? <laughs> this is my idea of when America was great. America was great uh, when there were 8,000 varieties of corn. Tremendous agrobiodiversity. Now you have to remember that corn is a Western hemispheric thing, you know, and uh, so our, our, our people, our ancestors, women. Women is who are seed collectors, because we farm, we garden, we know how it tastes, and we know how it stores. Right? We're really good at it. So those 8,000 varieties of corn were not developed by anybody from Monsanto, right, or Syngenta. They were developed by indigenous people. Tremendous amount of intellectual knowledge that is frankly not valued in scientific institutions, you know, in the nomenclature and in the knowledge. But we have that. That's when America was great, was when there was tremendous agrobiodiversity. America was great when there were 50 million buffalo. Passenger pigeons which blackened the sky. You could drink the water from every river and creek and forests were in abundance. That's when America was great. And I think everybody in this room is committed to how we restore and protect that greatness. That's an entirely different greatness than is talked about in the halls of Washington, you know? But this is my idea of what is great. This is my idea of what is great. No, the conflict between indigenous people and America is long won. You know, it's a long one. This is kind of in some ways, you know, Sitting Bull and Custer symbolizes the two different worldviews, the ideas of conquest. You know, I'm going to suggest to you simply that a, that, a, that a society based on conquest is not sustainable. At a certain point, you've got to quit. You've got to quit. This month in my language is called uh, Mean Gizus. It's followed by the Monomenike Gizus. Mean Gizus is the blueberry moon. 
Menominee Gizus is the wild rice making moon. Watibaga Gizus is the leaves changing color moon. Benakweo Gizus is when the leaves fall moon. Right? That's around October. November, gosh, Kadno Gizus. Freezing over moon. Manitou Gizus spoon, soons is a little spirit moon. Gishi Manitou Gizus is the great spirit moon. Namei Bene Gizus, that's around February. Sucker moon, kind of fish. Sucker moon. Una Bana Gizus, that's the March moon. March moon is Una Bana Gizus, also known as the hard crusted snow moon. The moon you don't want to do a face plant in the snow, right? You know, so those are some of the moons in our language. I thought you might like to hear the language of this, this uh, king, this land which is here. Oma a king. This is our, our Great Lakes territory. That's the language. It's the Algonquin language. Um, you know, and you and you heard that those moons are named after place. They're named after our natural world. And I think you also noticed that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor. Right? And part of this is, is like it is possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. It's okay. You can let that stuff go. It's not particularly helpful at this point, frankly. So let us think about what it is like to live in, in, in that and then see the contrast that just happened. So this is the, con the conflict, and you know it. You know, this is a different worldview that destroys biodiversity. This is where you don't have any birds anymore. This is the tar sands. You know, dirtiest oil in the world, Alberta, Athabascan River Basin. This is the consequences of that behavior, of our fossil fuel addiction. This is, you know, this is actually a fire in um, Fort McMurray, in the heart of the tar sands, right? It could be in California, you know? We live in a time of, um, you know, catastrophes of biblical proportions. That's the reality. You got fires to the west, you got seas falling apart to the south. You have birds, you have fish, you have whales dying in great numbers. You have, you know, the Arctic is melting. And you got a crazy guy with orange hair in the east, you know, who's screaming. I feel like his theme song is talking heads burning down the house. You know what I mean? It's like, let's just do it, right? We're not going to let him do that. We're not going to let him do that. We know the consequences of this behavior. You all know this. You know, I'm an economist by training, and I, and I do a lot of economic analysis of pipeline projects and mega projects, and I'm like, that's a bad idea. Long-term, full-cost accounting, you know? Who's going to pay for this stuff? They say by, by next year, we're going to be spending about 20% of world GDP on climate change-related disasters. That was Munich Re a few years ago. You know, maybe that's changed, but we have no idea, right? We are not in control of this one. We, like, broke the covenant. We broke the covenant, right? And when you do that, you don't get to say uncle anymore, right? So that's kind of where we are. Right? That is exactly where we are. So we have no idea of the price tag of all this. All we know is that it keeps going up. But the fact is, is that some peoples are responsible. So I spent my whole life trying to do the right thing. I farm, I raise a lot of kids, a lot of other people's children, frankly. You know, because kids need to be raised. Communities need to be built. You know, the retirement plan, my retirement plan is not a 401k. My retirement plan is having coherent young people. Right? That'd be a lot better. Right? Could have all the 401ks, right? You know what I'm saying? You could have all the 401ks in the world, but if there are people who are not thinking and coherent, not work out for us. We'll be stressing out till we're 90. <laughs> right? My mom's 86 and, and kicks my butt at yoga. Right? I don't tell her 90% of what I do because she don't need to worry. Right? But you know what I'm saying, exactly. You know, the fact is, is that this, you know, we all know what is happening around us. Nobody in this room has a case of denial, or I'm, I'm pretty sure if you go ask Ken or the website, you'll get that straightened out, right? But the fact is, is that there are names to those who do this. You know, as I said, I'm an economist by training. I'm facing the single largest pipeline project in North America. Enbridge, single largest pipeline company in North America. They're the main line system. I appreciate it when we talked about the Great Lakes here. I mean, I just want to say, because these are the Great Lakes. Um, you know, sometimes you have people in groups, and I just want to pose this to you as the Audubon Society, that refer to this region as the Upper Midwest. It's really aggravating to me, because that's such a weird thing to say. 
you understand what I'm saying? The upper Midwest of what West is that? You understand what I'm saying? That was like it's some kind of historical Andrew Jackson going west. I mean, where does that come from, the upper Midwest? Where are the Great Lakes? The Great Lakes pipeline projects are all Enbridge. comes out of Canada. You know, I laugh because, you know, in northern Minnesota, you know, we see what Trump does, his crazy stuff, you know? And then I see, like, he's all, you know, going to put this wall to the south. I said, I need a wall across the north? Thank you. Every project in Minnesota that we face, Canadian. Mining corporations, 75% of the world's mining corporations are Canadian. All the pipeline companies, Canadian. The tar sands, Canadian. You know, dirtiest oil in the world. So that's where I'd put the wall myself, you know. It's a different way of thinking. But I just want to say, we all know the price tag of some of this. So being, being who we are at Honor the Earth, we issued, this is just for this one pipeline. If you put 915,000 barrels a day of oil in a pipeline, you don't get to claim in your environmental impact statement that your carbon footprint is the footprint of your pumping stations. No. You have to claim all of it. You have to claim the fact that you're releasing and making possible 915,000 barrels a day of oil. This is what it looks like for the price tag. And the question I have is like, who's going to pay for that? Who is going to pay for taking that carbon out of the air? Right? You know, these are, these are math questions. These are economics questions. These aren't just questions of environment. This is the question of what is our plan in this? So we issued this a couple years ago. Enbridge has not yet responded to the creator, but we we're hoping. You see, at 2018, I issue, I've been issuing these updated invoices. I'll start adding, adding more interest on it, my God. OK. So I want to talk a little bit about where I come from, too. So I live in this place where you know, we are trying to do the best we can to keep where the wild things are. Most of the world's biodiversity is in indigenous territories. You all know that. You know, from the Amazon to Siberia, to the Arctic, to northern Minnesota, to Wisconsin. You look at a map of, of Wisconsin, and the only place that has a fully wooded block in it is the Menominee Reservation, right? For 150 years, they've been taking the same amount of trees off it every year. And, and they have this, you know, they, they can keep taking the same amount of trees off it because they have, what they have is a sustainable cutting practice, right? Now, what they are facing now is the blowdown of climate change. And they're trying to figure out how to figure that in because they don't plan anymore. They just salvage. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, and, and so, but what I am saying is that indigenous people are the people who are not only frontlining it. We've been saying no for a real long time, right? Really long time. But we are also putting our bodies on the line. So this is photos from Standing Rock, right? Now, I don't think, probably, did any of you guys go to Standing Rock? You guys don't look like the going to Standing Rock crowd. OK. But yeah, always time to support us. So I'm just going to say, you hung out with me. I've spent six years. I'm on my seventh year almost. I've been trying to get a divorce for a couple years from Enbridge. You know, I didn't wake up and say I want to fight a pipeline project. You understand what I'm saying? But they said they want to put it you know, through the middle of our reservation. I'll put it to a head. This is us. This is my reservation. These are other reservations. This is northern Minnesota. And so Enbridge has six lines that go through on that first yellow patch. This Leech Lake Reservation said they can't put a new pipeline through there. Six is enough. I think six is enough. Y'all understand what I'm saying? They got a 50-year-old pipeline in there, just runs to the Straits of Mackinac. That's our pipe. We're up pipe from y'all, right? Y'all understand what, you know what I'm saying? Because the Audubon Society did some work on that, Straits of Mackinac. So what we're trying to do is stop this next line. So first they proposed in 2013 this pipeline called the Sandpiper. Really, you guys should have said something about that, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we started saying no Sandpiper, we were all like, we like Sandpipers, right? You know, you guys should not let them appropriate your stuff, right? Just a hint from Native people. Don't let other people appropriate your stuff. So, you know, they announced this new pipeline because Leech Lake Reservation says we're not giving you a permit to cross. We're done. Six is enough. They announced us a new pipeline. This pipeline was called the Sandpiper, and it was a fracked oil pipeline coming out of North Dakota. Really? You know, I mean, everybody knows it's the craziest thing out there, right? Um, and I didn't know nothing about it, and then one day I read in the paper that they're going to put in this pipeline, and I was like, no, they aren't. That's ridiculous, you know, and so I had to summon up every bit of knowledge I had and do a bunch of research because I was looking around and I was trying to see, well, who's going to do this? What? I was like, well, I guess we should just stand up on it. And so we fought them. 
We fought them for three years, from 2013 to 2016. Fought them, what do I mean? I went to every regulatory hearing. Y'all done that, right? You know, every single hearing. We filed lawsuits, and we turned out in the streets. That's what we did. We turned out in the streets by the thousands to say, you're not going to put this pipeline in. And in 2016, the, the uh, Friends of the Headwaters, a grassroots group in northern Minnesota of lakeshore owners, said, we're going to file a lawsuit and require an environmental impact statement on this proposed pipeline project. Because somehow the state of Minnesota, the enlightened state between Wisconsin and North Dakota, you know, we kind of think of ourselves as that, right? They uh, didn't think that you should do an EIS on a, on a 640,000 barrel per day pipeline project, right? Right. Court ordered. Court ordered. They appealed the decision, right? The state appealed the decision to do an EIS. Like, I'm kind of with you. I, I want democracy to work. I want the system to work. I want regulatory agencies to work, right? I want, I want things to work for the people, not for Canadian corporations, right? I, I signed up for this one. You know, so we went every hearing, and then that lawsuit was filed, and, and, and about two months later, after all this massive opposition, I'm trying to draw a picture of you that it, for you, but it's not just a lawsuit. It's a social movement, right? It's education. It's regulatory processes. Stopping bad guys, stopping windigos. That's what we call them, windigos, windigos, cannibals. You got to be smart. You know, so August 2nd, 2016, they canceled that project, the Sandpiper. They canceled the Sandpiper. <laughs> and that challenge we face is that then what they did is they went to the path of least resistance, which was North Dakota. A, a, you know, a state entirely purchased by oil companies. Now, how do I make this go back to, guys? Or I point it to you? The backwards one ain't going. This is what, oh, look at that, see? I'm 60 years old, sometimes my technology don't work right. But you guys are all 62, about half of you, huh? <laughs> I see that. I see my people out there. So this is what it looked like at Standing Rock. Oh, are you grabbing my clothes? And I said, oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my sister there, pretty sure I. Um, so this is what it looks like on the front lines. I won't pretend on this, I'm just saying, this is what it happens when you go to the deep north. That's what we call North Dakota, the deep north, where native people are not valued. Our arrest rates, our poverty rates, our lack of infrastructure, our health disparities, our economic disparities are rampant, tolerated, and, and condoned by the state of North Dakota, frankly. Theft of land, things like the Pick Sloan Diversion Project, damned the entire Missouri River Basin system, changed the ecology, right? Flooded, flooded our territories. You all understand this history, and you understand the ecological impacts of, that, of these mega projects. Because you're the Audubon Society. You know that mega projects aren't good for birds either, right? Did all that, and then besides that, you go out there and say, I'm a water protector, and I believe you should not put a pipeline, you know, 500 feet away from an intake of a tribal water system that's already old, right? And you stand up as a water protector, and that's what you get. That's what you get. And so I stand in front of you as a water protector. You know, in the state of North Dakota, to say you're a water protector, they still look at you. And I was like, no, we're all water protectors. As a matter of fact, I actually think everybody should be a water protector, unless you've got some other idea how to live. Right? <laughs> unless you've got some other idea how to live. You've got to be a water protector. And I'm not saying that this is what you want to do, but I'm saying someone's got to do that sometimes. The brutality of force, $38 million worth of military force levied upon our people. 800 people arrested, a lot of them non-Indian people who came to join us. You know, a lot of them came to join us. A lot of people arrested, a lot of people injured. A lot of people injured. Sophia Walensky's arm was almost blown off when they, when they lobbed a grenade, basically, at her. You know? So what I'm saying is, is that this is where corporations are. The rights of corporations supersede the rights of people. That's the country we are living in right now, and we need to change that if we're going to survive. <clears throat> you know, they say that corporations are considered persons under the law. You all know that, right? Having the same status as a person. I feel like a corporation is not a person. 
corporation doesn't have a soul. To be a person, you have to have a soul. You know, and so the legal institutions of this country need to protect the rights of life, the rights of humans over the rights of corporations. But this is what happens when corporate power is unleashed on people, you know? And in the end, that was a, that was a, that was a 570,000 barrel a day pipeline that they got through, you know, in the end, Trump pushed it through, you know? I'm not sure since a lot of it was built how else to have stopped it, but you know, what I'm gonna tell you is, is that in Minnesota, there's no line built, there's no line built. This is the bigger picture. I'll give you a short lesson on pipelines. This is where your oil should not come from. And why I say Canada is a problem. You know, because what they have is an economy which is predicated on extraction. They haven't moved on. They don't have an integrated economy. They have an extractive mining economy. It's really old, right? And so now we're at this place which is, you know, it's like peak oil or it's, it's we're at this point of extreme extraction. That's what it's called when you hit the bottom of the barrel and you start ending up with doing like crazy stuff to get your oil because you got an addiction. You know, what's that look like? It's extreme extraction looks like things like blowing off the top of a bunch of mountaintops in Appalachia to get some coal to ship to where? India, right? Extreme extraction is fracking. Blowing up the bedrock, putting 602 chemicals down that you don't have to report on because of Dick Cheney and the Energy Policy Act of 2005, right? Extreme extraction is drilling 20,000 feet under the ocean and hoping that's gonna work out for you, whoever you are, shell, oil, or whatever, until you get something like what? Deepwater Horizon. Extreme extraction is the tar sands, right? There's no oil like just spurting anywhere now. So we're at this place and in northern Minnesota, we're also facing in the boundary waters this mine, 1% copper. Bottom of the barrel, bottom of the barrel. No time like the present to move on, you know? And that's, that's really this moment. So Canada has these five pipelines they've been trying to get going. 2015, they were all active. The northern one, pink is called uh, Northern Gateway, was an Enbridge proposal, did not happen. Just trying to take that oil over to like this really great fishing port. Put it on some tankers for what country? China, right? This is all about Chinese markets. Second pipeline called uh, Energy East. That one is the longest pipeline proposal in Canada. That did not happen. Citizens opposition is what killed that one. Can't go through Montreal. No province wanted that one. Long pipeline, expensive, right? Leaving three pipelines. Y'all got this two down. Leaving three pipelines. Keystone, no, we thought we had that one, right? Obama did not approve the permit for that pipeline, right? And then Trump has come in and tried to do some manifestations to reboot it with his fairy dust, right? Montana court ruled a few, I don't know, in like February, March, that you can't just have a presidential permit which approves a pipeline over a previous presidential decision. You have to give a reason. <laughs> you don't get to say just because I'm president, right? Which is generally what Trump seems to do. Because I'm president, I get to do that, right? That's racked up in courts, but moving at some pace, but it's racked up in courts. Now, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, being this blue one, is a really interesting case of insanity. I don't know if anybody's been following that. But that's a pipeline project that, again, no one wants. You know, no one wants going to, you know, just Vancouver is where it's going to. So they've been fighting that for years. And, I'll sh you know, there's some, some pictures of what that looks like I'll show you here in a minute. But major, you know, opposition and then court decisions. So, um, Last year in August or September, the courts in Canada ruled that you can't put a pipeline project across indigenous territories without their consent. Interesting idea. Now, for those of you who follow any policy issues, it's not just consent, it's not consultation. It's not consultation. Consultation means you come talk to them and tell them what you're gonna do. That's consultation. I've been there. Consent, actually, that the UN term is free, prior, and informed consent. Free, prior. That doesn't mean gun to your head, consent. Doesn't mean we cut off all of the money for your social service programs, consent. Right? Y'all understand what I'm talking about here. That's what's going on right now. So that's what the court ruled. And then, uh, but the day before that, Premier Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, watching this pipeline like flail, purchase the pipeline for $4.5 billion, 
right? From Kinder Morgan, Texas-based oil company. They got like a 600% boost on that one, right? Good deal, 4.5 billion. And then here, um, so he's been sitting there with this pipeline project. And about two months ago, he announced, they announced that they're gonna try to get the Indians to um, own the pipeline, the First Nations, right? It was really interesting math. I wrote a couple of articles on it, but it's like, so you got a bunch of people who are below the poverty level that you're gonna saddle with, I think it's like $57 million worth of interest payments. You understand what I'm saying? It's like if you can't get anybody to like your pipeline, you try to pretend that the Indians like it, and it's an Indian project. That's what he's doing. Bad idea. Bad idea. It's not going to happen. Then the last pipeline is line three, single largest pipeline project. As I said, six years of opposition, still going strong. No pipeline, no pipeline. In the regulatory system, they are locked up, and there's no pipeline built in Minnesota. And I just want to say I'm going to welcome you all later to come to Minnesota. If things go bad in the regulatory system, you can always come camp at Itasca Park with us. Because that's where the line is, Itasca Park, right? A lot of ducks, a lot of geese, a lot of birds, right? As I said, this is what it looks like at British Columbia, opposing the pipeline. This is what it looks like in Duluth, opposing the pipeline. Massive citizen opposition across the board. And then this was me last year. No, this was me three months ago when I decided to go to the Enbridge shareholders meeting in Calgary. I was standing there with my girlfriend and I, these guys were like screaming, screaming, build that pipe, build that pipe, build that pipe. And I was sitting there thinking, well, you got 10,000 people laid off in the tar sands. They all want a job. I was like, I'm not your problem. My, your problem is that you don't have a, second, a plan B. I'm not your problem, you know? Y'all need to think through what the plan is instead of blaming the Indians, you know. But that's, that was me, uh, you know, May, May 8th, my trauma for the day. <laughs> so, here's the plan. Y'all good? Take a breath. Fight pipelines, y'all got that, right? Fight bad projects, y'all got that? Now, let's, t let's talk about what the solution is. They call this the Green New Deal. I refer to this as the Sitting Bull Plan. The reason I do that is because he was a really great thinker, and he said a long time ago something like, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. Let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. It's not like a one smart guy plan. It's like everybody can do something to make the change, and that's what we have to do. It's at a local level, it's a regional level, state, county, you understand what I'm saying? That's how change is made. So, also called the Green New Deal. Let me just, you know, I spend a lot of my time on energy economics, but people say, for instance, that you can't move to renewable energy. And I, I you know, I gotta meet with the, I wanna hear about the guy with the wind turbine thing, because I get, all the time I get battles over this. And I was like, yeah, some of those wind turbines were not set up for birds. I saw Altamont Pass look like a bunch of blenders out there, for crying out loud, right? You don't wanna run birds through there. So, you know, people say you can't meet present demand with renewable energy. My argument is, why would you want to meet present demand? Right? This is Lawrence Livermore Lab in 2008. And this is us in 2017. So if you look at these figures over here, rejected energy, 66.7%. We waste 66.7% of our power between point of, of production or from the point of origin and the point of consumption. And everybody here knows how we do that. You know, first of all, we got way too much junk we're powering. You know, we, if we could just start here and go backwards, you know, I know that they did the LED lights and he, LED lights in here, but I'm saying it's like, at what point do you figure out how to be a little more efficient? You just go to Germany and they just, you know, they have a little thing to, to turn your plug on. You don't have an, a, a ghost load operating all the time in every building. You don't need to have everything on demand. You all understand what I'm saying on that, you know? So you start at this level and then you go all the way back to the point of origin. I mean, because the fact is, is that so $82 a barrel for, for fossil fuels coming out of the tar sands, dirtiest oil in the world, and they ain't even counting the, the you know, larger economic cost of that stuff. And then you try to stuff it in a pipeline, move it a thousand miles. How much energy you lose at this whole thing? How much energy we lose at those power lines? That's my point. You don't want to meet present demand. What you really want to do, what you really want to do is, is be efficient. That's what smart countries do. We're efficient. 
So, you know, y'all know this stuff, you know? You move to renewable energy and you move to efficiency. This is what we're doing in my community. So, I live on the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. Nobody would bet on us. We'll go with that. You know, nobody really cares about us. We'll go with that, too. You know, not even, you know, can't even get a water system in my village, frankly. Water's brown half the time. I was like, but they got enough money to build a $7 billion pipeline. But I don't have no water that works. Literally. Literally. That's what we're facing. That's what, uh, you know, economic justice, environmental justice, that's what that's about. You know? So we, we, we're over there on White Earth and we're cold in the winter. Y'all get cold in the winter too. So it turns out there's these panels called solar thermal panels. We've been buying them and installing them on our houses. You put them on the south facing wall of your little house. And it, uh, you know, it's just like an eight by four panel and it's black on the outside and the heat collects in this space. And then you have this blower fan that turns on when the temperature heat hits 90. It's like the low hanging fruit of winter heating. You could save up to 20% of your heating bill. So why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do smart stuff like that? Like reduce your consumption, right? And so we, bit, we bought them for a long time and then we purchased the facility. And so now on our reservation, we, buy, we, we make solar thermal panels. That's Ronnie who actually makes them. I don't make them. But this is an example of me, us putting them on, right? Travel housing project, solar panel going on. You know, I mean, you know, so across the board, and those are available nationally, if any of you are interested, we're, you know, they're SRCC certified, 8th Fire Solar. We just started production, our first ones came off the line about a month ago, super excited, you know. This is um, a little bit of a picture of tribal renewable energy potential. And I wanna say that because we have borne the burden of America's stupid energy policy, frankly, you know, for 50 years. What's that mean? You know, you know a third of all Western low sulfur coal strip mine from native lands. Four of the 10 largest coal mining projects in the country were on native lands. Navajo Nation, one year produced enough energy to feed the needs of the New Mexico for 32 years. Yet 85% of their households have no electricity. 10 uranium mines, five uranium mills. You understand what I'm saying? 42, 44 uranium mines and 10, 10 uranium mills. Basically what I'm saying is that that's what colonization looks like. When you go in there and you make those people produce a bunch of power that you sell, make huge profits, pay them 15 cents a ton for coal. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So what if we evolved? So in the past year, amazing changes have happened in Indian country. These are, this is wind potential. So if you look up there in that green space up there in Montana, super windy state. Well, coal strip, I don't know if anybody here is from Montana, but coal strip, what, three and four are closing down by the end of the year? Two of the like horrible coal fire generators in Montana. Time to move on. Now, if I had class seven wind, and I was in Montana, and I was the Crow tribe, who's been the, you know, at the beck and call of, the, of Westmoreland and the fossil fuels industry for a damn long time, I'd be trying to figure out how to put wind on, right? Fill that demand. Same thing down in the Southwest. BHP Billiton offloaded a coal strip mine to the Navajos, Navajo generating station. These, these coal generators are closing down, and the Navajos are not buying them, leaving huge potential for solar. Right? So what I'm saying is, is like the future is being made. I want you all to know that we're part of making it. I want you to support us making it. Because it's not just having the power. It's also justice. If the power comes from the same people who've been exploited for the past 50 years by energy corporations. And the other thing is, is just be honest. We got the power lines. We got the power lines. You know, you have a coal generator, you got power lines. And, and everybody here knows that putting solar or wind online, you got to have access to the grid for anything that's, you know, we got to have local solar, local wind, but then you have to have grid access. So this is what the future looks like. And this is a really interesting idea. <clears throat> <clears throat> I wonder if I have my full chart on this, but this is a really interesting idea. Have any of you heard of solutionary rail? Really interesting idea. It's coming out of the Northwest. But basically, you know, we have a train system which I think, uh, you know, has been described as an embarrassment to Bulgaria. <laughs> right? Y'all know what I'm saying, right? First world country, not a first world train system by any means, right? And we used to move stuff around, stuff around. We used to move people, and now we just move coal and fossil fuels and toxic stuff by and large, right? We need to move people. 
Rail is still far more efficient than anything else. I mean, just think about it. Metal on metal is better than rubber on the road, right? So you have like a 40 or 50% more efficiency by moving it by rail, and then you do something like you go electric train, right? The United States has 1% of its trains electrified. But most European countries, 16%, 30%, 40%, I think Italy is about 60% electrified. And what you do is you do this really cool thing is that you put those power lines there and you use those wind turbines to power those trains. Because a lot of those, those trains go through our territories. And so you use the, the, the rail lines as transmission lines for renewable energy. I'm saying you guys are a big organization. You've got to have big vision to solve problems, right? Don't be like just, you know, just putzing around. You know, real change. I mean, I didn't mean to say it like that. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is if we're going to turn this thing around, you've got to, like, step up. You've got to step up with vision. You've got to step up with solutions. That's what you've got to do, you know? <laughs> There it is, you know, that's the chart. I mean, you know, how backwards you ought to be, America. Let, let's get, let's be step it up. Milwaukee used to have a really good electric train system. It was one of the best train systems in the country that was electric, you know. Um, I was just in Duluth last weekend, and I was like, that, they, they restored this historic engine that was spewing all this black coal into the air. I said, that was a dumb restoration project. I was like, all pretty and everything, but I said, why don't y'all just go electric? You know, if you're going to spend $750,000, why don't you just go electric, right? Think visionary. Think about, you know, everybody here knows the impact of these things, that, you know. These are the changes that need to be made. And this is how they're made. This is my, my friend Molina Lubicon. She's from the middle of the Tar Sands, a little village called Little Buffalo. And so their, their health clinic was powered with a diesel generator. Welcome to Indian country. I mean, I haul water. You know, a lot of our people haul water, right? That's what I'm saying. Electricity, you have a mega project, but you still don't have power for your clinic. You know, that's wrong. So her master's thesis at the University of Victoria was on uh, putting up a solar panel project for a solar panel project for, her, for her, her clinic. You know, I'm just saying she didn't write about it, she just did it, right? Pretty much that's my motto, just do it. You know, you could do some studies on it, but we don't got time for studies. If you want your villages to survive in climate change, you better get local. You gotta get local food, you gotta get local energy. So we took her project, and this is me with our 20 kilowatts of solar we did at our Pine Point school. You know, so this is what a little community does to make a difference. This is our larger plan for microgrid. This is Leech Lake, the next reservation over. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of innovation. You know, we face tremendous diverse ad adversity and we have a much more enlightened vision. And what we need to do is kind of like let go of some bags that are not necessary because the paradigm does not work. You know, all around the world, people are doing this kind of stuff, solar, microgrids, time to step up. You know, this is the kind of things that we can do. And, and my other feeling is like if we can do it, anybody can do it. This is the Navajo Solar Project, 27,000 households. You know, that's what you need to do. And then we have my hemp project. So I'm a hemp farmer. Four years, permit, state of Minnesota. I grow fiber hemp. Why am I doing that? Because the revolution and the future is not fossil fuels. So it turns out that the word canvas comes from cannabis. Who knew that? Canvas comes from cannabis because everything used to be made of hemp, right? Everything used to be made of hemp. They used to require people grew hemp in this country. It's like one of the most diverse crops. And Minnesota itself used to have 11 hemp mills. We clothed ourselves. We did all our canvas, all our ropes. So I just want to restore that one, right? So I've been growing this fiber hemp. This is my team, some sons, my partner, Ronnie. This is the Get Stuff Done team with my fiber hemp field. This is when I went out there with Nicolette. So when I complained about that weeds, I was like, in the field, I was like, what? The eight foot tall hemp plants? I know I look really stoned, but I'm not. <laughs> I was like, wow, my hemp plants got big while I wasn't looking. 
Um, that's what that was. This is just a little bit more on hemp. You know, so I tell you this because, you know, the solutions are apparent. You got to transition post fossil fuels. And people say, you know, one guy was like, well, why don't, I'm, I'm building a hemp mill. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to build a hemp mill on my reservation. I got my, my a decorticator from China. I got a rope making machine from China because that's right. We don't make anything in this country anymore. Right? Y'all know that. And then uh, I've been looking at all this milling equipment. And I'm trying to figure out how to build a, a, a mill that I can run on wind energy. That's my plan. You know, and I think it's doable. I got a combination of things, but that's what I'm working on. And, and the reason is, is like someone said, you should, you should like do something really cool, like make coasters. He actually said make coasters. I said, no, I want to make coasters. You know, I want to change the world. I ain't going to change the world making coasters. <laughs> I said, I want to make canvas, right? Those, you know, 10,000 lakes all got boats covered with plastic, fossil fuels, right? Filsons, you all know what I'm talking about? Filsons or Duluth Pack or Patagonia. I did a whole bunch of stuff with Patagonia. They're all hemp. That's what they're moving towards. Why? Because it's better for the environment, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to change things. And then we'll protect our wild rice. This is what wild rice looks like, you know? That's not a field, that's rice. That's wild rice from Big Rice Lake. Fought off the pipeline, you know? Fought the pipeline off that lake because that's the mother load of wild rice. That's our life. That's our life. That's me and Don Goodwin out there looking at our rice crop. I was out there a couple weeks ago and I said, looks good. Because of climate change, southern lakes got pounded with water. But the northern lakes are still good. Just pray, pray, pray that we get our, our harvest in. You know, because that's how we all eat. You know, and because it is so significant to us, my tribe passed the rights of Monoman. On uh, December 31st, I was like there at the council meeting of 2018, my tribe recognized the rights of Monoman as having the right to continue our, its existence the right to be free of contamination, the right to be genetically you know, not contaminated, the right to have, be oil free, the right to continue as a wild rice ecosystem. That's what we are, we're a wild rice ecosystem. It defines our territory. It's a part of our migration story. And the, the, what we took our cues from is of course Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, the first indigenous president of a country in the Western Hemisphere. And 10 years ago, might even be, be more than 10 years ago, they passed the rights of nature as a part of the constitution of their country. You know, and internationally, that is moving, you know, whether it is in Ecuador, whether it is the rights of rivers in New Zealand, right, the rights of the Himalayan glaciers. But to me, this is kind of this fundamental spiritual legal question. You know, we, we understand that rice has a more rights than Enbridge. We understand that the rights of, the na of nature, the rights of the birds, the rights of our relatives, the rights of our water precedes and is superior to the rights of any corporation. We think that that needs to be encoded into legal systems in this country where our wild rice is recognized, you know. So our tribal nations have passed these, you know, regulations. And, uh, you know, that is because that's our understanding. So I guess the picture I'm trying to show you is one of how people who you don't bet on can make a difference, right? Y'all got that one? You know, we are like scrapping away, but it's our survival. You know, most of the time we ain't even waiting for a grant. I'm just praying. Like I do so much stuff. We have so little money in our organization. I know Audubon knows what it's like to like kind of start things and you're like, okay, we're going to pray this works out. You know, we do that, but we do that because it's all about all of our survival up there. We're a little scrappy bunch, and we've waited for other people to fix things for us, but it's just not going to happen. You know, so rather than waiting and getting an ulcer, waiting and complaining, why wouldn't we just do our best, do our best to make things right? That's us. You know, and I think that's a lot of us. It needs to be a lot of us. Find your power. Don't let someone take that from you. You know, people always say, you know, who, who'd you ask to do that? I said, I work for Mother Earth. You know, I work for the rice. Someone has to stand up for those things, and then soon, at some point, policy and elected officials will get a, get a clue. But if you wait for them, you know, things will not be here for us. And y'all know that. Y'all know that. So act like it. You're, you're conscious and you're coherent. A lot of people ain't that, you know? So 
monarch. I, always, I, I put this up here for you because it's, you know, of the imago cells. Is that how you call them, imago cells? Thank you. I was like, I was like, but so these guys, super interesting, like I learned from all our relatives. You know, it's funny, like I'm the one who like, don't know if I could eat that mushroom until I look at some animal and it's like, oh, they ate it, I could eat it. I do stuff like that. Like that's like risky stuff, but the, you know, we work it out, me and my animals. I haven't been poisoned. But anyway, <laughs> well, you all understand what I'm saying, right? It was, you know, I, don't, I won't go down that tangent, but you know, so this, this guy, this German guy come and want to interview me. I should tell that story because I'm really, you know, it's like not my thing usually to do, do you know, interviews with German reporters. They're so time consuming and they're so like, they sometimes they scowl while they're interviewing you. <laughs> I don't know if you ever know, super uptight generally. But this guy is like, want to interview me and then he comes and I was like, oh. oh. And then he said, you know, he tells me about this project he just did which is discussing imago cells. So it turns out that these guys, when they're a caterpillar, they, they go through this transformation in the chrysalis to become a butterfly. But they do something nothing else does, which is, is that they like liquidate themselves. Y'all know that, right? Like that's like the craziest thing in the world. I heard they liquidate themselves and then these cells appear, which are called these imago cells, and the first ones show up, and they all get killed off. The second ones show up and then they get killed off, and then they keep growing in number until they transform that little chrysalis into this beautiful butterfly. May make one, may make one. That's our word for a butterfly, may make one, may make one. You know, it uh, has to do with this. But we also have this word, may make which is little people, related words, see? You know, it's like how you name things is part of how you understand the world, right? Little magical beings that you kind of see at the corner of your eye. May make one. So we are the, the imago cells. We're the social imago cells. You know, you say something, they say no. You say it again, they say no. And then at a certain point, enough of you say it, and it changes. That's how change is made. There's not like a social change fairy, you know? There's not, and there's not a nuclear waste fairy or a carbon sequestration fairy. Y'all know that, right? You know, the change is us. We're the ones who change the behavior. We're the ones who change the policies. We're the ones who change how we relate to Mother Earth. We're the ones who do it. Personal responsibility to do that. With whatever powers you have, different than mine, we all got powers though. This guy, the imago cells, that's what I think of. This is our old squash. Just say it's called Gete Okosamen. For the benefit of y'all here, I grow that squash given to me. He said it was 800 years old, came from a, a dig north of here. They dug down clay ball, cracked that ball, inside were these seeds, carbon dated, 800 years old. That's a story I was told. So this is squash I grew, it's in my garden. But um, so, that's the story I was told. Then somebody corrected me and said, that's not right. I said, well, what's the real story? They said, well, it's a, it's a Miami squash and it's a thousand years old. I said, okay. <laughs> Glad we got corrected on that one, right? So then I was talking about it and people are saying, well, what's that called? What's that called? I said, I don't know what that's called. You know, but me, I talk all, these, all the time. So I said, um, okay, I'm gonna name that squash because as you know, being the Audubon Society, white guys name stuff all the time. Did y'all notice that? All busy naming everything. This one named after me, 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 me. <laughs> naming stars, naming everything. Gotta have a name for it. Usually super anthropocentric about that name too, right? Y'all notice that, right? Okay, we'll just leave that aside, but anyway. So I said, I'm gonna name this. I'm gonna name this, because y'all name stuff all the time. So I call this squash Gete Okosaban, which in Ojibwe means really cool old squash. Right? So then, you know, how you know you've arrived is we are in the Baker Seed Catalog this year. <laughs> the whole seed catalog, right? As Gete Okosavit, I was like, made it, we made it. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I have a lot of hope. Each of those squash has about 1,600 seeds in it. Now, if that isn't about hope, you understand what I'm saying? If that isn't about possibility, tell me what is. These plants, our relatives, have life for us. They teach us, they give us hope. Keep our covenant, water them, you get squash. Take care of them, you know, take care of them. There's a, it's, it's, you know, Mexican proverb, but I think of this a lot, right? We are seeds, we are life. And then finally, as my last promised note, 
So there is no pipeline built in Minnesota. No pipeline built. 300 miles of pipe, massive opposition. 68,000 people came out and testified against the pipeline. Demonstrations, about 17 lawsuits. They are stuck in the legal system. They are stuck. Enbridge wants this pipeline more than anything else in the world. They're like crying up there. But for those of you who are looking at the, the failing infrastructure in this country, we have a D in infrastructure. Y'all got that, right? And so everything is crumbling. And so you have this mainline tar sands pipeline system, which is 50 or 60 years old. And what they want to do is keep that stuff up in face of climate change. And they want new pipes. I'm like saying time to retire your stuff, buddy. You know, we need to stop line three because line three lead, you know, feeds line five. If you want to, if you, want to you know, we all got to work together on this is what I'm saying. So nobody in Minnesota really wants this pipeline. They're Minnesotans for line three. It turns out it was the CEO of them is the chair of Enbridge. I was like, really? So this is what we look like. Welcome water protectors. And uh, so we invite you to come join us. We're about to launch on our website. I was crying about our website to your web guy here. Give us a couple weeks. The Welcome Water Protectors campaign. And we will, we will show you the places you can camp in Minnesota. Minnesota's full of camping opportunities. You know, we do not expect that this will be like Standing Rock, a full-on $38 million worth of military you know, equipment, but I have to say that the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission issuing a permit, a rogue decision, asked the Enbridge Corporation point blank if they would pay for the police to put in the pipeline. Wow. Huh? So let me get this right. A Canadian corporation going to finance the brutalization of Minnesota citizens. You know, I am 60 years old. I do not deserve to be beat up by a Canadian corporation so they could put a pipeline across my wild rice. You know? I'm a water protector. I'm a water protector. So what we are issuing, and I'm telling you all this, is you should come to Minnesota. You should come there anyway, but we, will, we are giving you places to camp right along the pipeline route, like Itasca Park. There you go. Come to Itasca Park. Get familiar. You know, I don't want to have the soundtrack of Joni Mitchell, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Right? I want you all to come up there to make sure it's not gone. Come visit us. We'll issue a map, and it shows you every pipe yard in Minnesota. Why am I telling you that? Because why would we let the pipes move? You all understand what I'm saying? I'm going to stand in front of a pipe yard. They ain't going to build a pipe in Minnesota. That's what's going to happen. And thousands of people are going to go up there. And you all don't want to miss the party. <laughs> this could be so much fun. We have music. We have concerts. We have first-rate camping. It's Minnesota. It's like, not like North Dakota. <laughs> right? It's like super fun. So this is our Welcome Waters Protectors campaign. This is one of my favorite water protectors. That's Cowboy. He, you know, he rides horse with me all the time. Awesome guy. Water's life. That's it. You know, 1701, our people signed an agreement. We made an agreement with the Iroquois Confederacy in, in Montreal. The, the, year, the year is 1701. The Anishinaabe and the Iroquois made an agreement. It's a treaty. It's known as the One Dish, One Spoon Treaty. It's also a wampum belt. You all know I'm talking about those wampum belts? Those Iroquois wampum belts, that's what it is. It's recorded in a wampum belt. One dish, one spoon. And in 1701, our people, a large, large nation, and the Iroquois, a large nation, came together in Montreal and said, one dish, we all live in the same area. We have one dish from which we eat. We all eat in the same dish. So I will not take more animals than you do, right? We understood in 1701, we understood far before that, but like, that's what we got to do. Think about each other. Think about our relatives. One dish, one spoon. One spoon is, is that if you are relatives, you share a spoon. That is how you know that you, are, you have this relationship. And to me, that's kind of this moment. You know, one dish, one spoon. We all got the same dish. You know, we are all related, whether we have wings or fins or roots or paws. We're all in this together. It's really our opportunity to stand up and be those spiritual beings that the Creator and our relatives need us to be, to find our inner strength to find our inner strength, to reach out, get over your fear, quit, you know, doubting yourself. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. It's right there. It's all around us every day. You know, 
and we make beautiful. We make beautiful. Miigwech, I want to thank you for your time.